Father, we are grateful to you for this time, Lord. Once again, you have brought us together to meditate on your word and to study your word. Lord, I pray that uh, for time that we spend in fellowship with uh, our brethren and in your presence, uh, studying your word may be a time of blessing for us, Lord. Open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to uh, explore the truths that you are you wanted to teach us to teach to us lord and which may edify our relationship with you so that we may be able to experience you more intimately lord your love and life may be manifested in and through us and this bible study may be a medium and may become a channel through which we all can be we all can edify one another oh lord in the spirit lead us and guide us through everything we do we speak we discuss your name be exalted in jesus name we pray amen amen okay. We have been studying over the past, uh, I think, two weeks or so, uh, the subject of sin. And uh, we have been delving into our booklet, which is titled, We Believe. So it is our, uh, basically our GCI's official position. Once again, this is not a closed creed. Uh, this, these booklets are constantly revised and reviewed. And uh, uh, we update for the sake of, you know, continuous progressive growth, you know, in our understanding. Uh, these, what we are doing at the moment is in the, in, the pro, in the form of a question and answer. And I must mention, Suryamurthy rightly said, sometimes the answers may not have a direct relevance or it is not clear enough. And uh, that is absolutely true. Uh, like I said, very difficult subjects like these to nail it down uh, to, you know, one or two sentences. Sometimes you need several sentences and still you don't do justice to it. So I realized that uh, there are some limitations in uh, trying to uh, comprehensively discuss many of these uh, very complex subjects. But nevertheless, uh, God has given us his scriptures uh, and, uh, of course, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in, in the uh, uh, you know, in the confidence of the scriptures and the uh, illumination of the Holy Spirit, we continue to struggle and to continue to know. And so sin is a subject which once again eludes, uh, you know, full explanation because it's beyond uh, human comprehension. And today <laughs> we are going to discuss one of those, right? Of course, we uh, discussed the first one, which is what is sin? Once again, it is, uh, the, it is answered in several statements, uh, trying to be inclusive. You know, we try to include lots of concepts and aspects uh, to try to explain sin in the best way possible. But that is obviously, you know, we can say it's not sufficient. Why is sin so bad? We discussed that last time. And uh, one of the things that in GCI we do accept the fact that we do not take sin casually. We don't take sin lightly. Sin is a serious aspect of, you know, what, uh, uh, what we need to understand and know. Sin is destructive. It, is, it, it corrupts. And so we see the result and the effect of sin, uh, you know, in our lives, in the lives of others, on, uh, you know, our emotions, our relational perspectives, even uh, the way, you know, the, uh, the way we deal with the environment, there are so many elements of sinfulness, you could say, in all of this. So uh, once again, that was one of those you know, uh, points that may not have a full comprehensive answer. But today we'll go to the last uh, question and uh, I'm going to bring up, and I think I already put it up on the, uh, on the WhatsApp chat, the origin of sin, and uh, that's another mind-bending, uh, you know, perspective that we can look at. But uh, let's go ahead and read the question, and then we'll read the answer. And I will try to bring in some points before we get into a discussion. Praveen, are you pulling up that point? Uh, there we are. This is uh, question uh, three. If Jesus Christ has already conquered the devil and sin, why is there still so much evil in the world? 
the answer reads, no one can say why, for evil is a terrible abyss beyond rational explanation. Its ultimate origin is obscure and its enormity perplexes us. It is most simply what ought not to be. Nevertheless, we boldly affirm that God's triumph over evil is certain. In Jesus Christ, God suffers with us, knowing all our sorrow. In raising him from the dead, God gives new hope to the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, is himself God's promise that suffering will come to an end, that death shall be no more, that evil has no future, and that all things will be made new. So that is uh, how we have uh, sort of formulated our answer. Uh, I want to now just pick up uh, this aspect of the its origin, because in the uh, answer, one of the statements reads, its ultimate origin is obscure, right? Uh, and this is something that, uh, uh, you know, there is, you know, I mean, we can reason in, in, in so many different ways, but there are so many teachings about this. And I, let me just spend a few moments in that, and then uh, I'll come to some of the other points. But I spend a little extra time in this particular thought that I just picked up, the origin of sin. Now, the various teachings on the origin of sin, I'm talking about uh, from a biblical perspective. I'm not talking about any other perspective. Uh, many feel that humankind is the originator of sin or it originated in human beings. And of course, we can remember the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve had the free choice of choosing between the two trees. Uh, and so some people tend to uh, indicate that Sin originated in free choice, in the fact that we were given the ability to choose. But we do also know that there was a temptation behind that. And we have the uh, introduction of the serpent, and we all understand and know what the serpent represents. So the question is, uh, though Adam and Eve had free choice, and yet they exercised it through temptation, you know, uh, and thus introduced sin into the world, the question can be asked, where did the serpent come from? Uh, does, the, does the serpent have any responsibility in the introduction of sin? So these are, you know, uh, this is one way of looking at it. Now, when we talk about the serpent, we know that uh, we can go back uh, uh, into the Old Testament and read about Lucifer, the anointed cherub, and uh, uh, and we know Lucifer turned Satan. Jesus refers to Satan and how he, you know, fell. He beheld, behold, uh, beheld a Satan falling. Uh, so that predates Adam and Eve. And there is a very clear indication that this particular being who is an anointed cherub sinned. Uh, and that is found in Ezekiel 28, which I will pick up in just a few moments. But let me just... Uh, highlight a few more thoughts. Uh, some people tend to believe that God is responsible or the originator for sin. And they will quote some scriptures, especially from Isaiah, where God says, I create evil, right? And I'm not going to go there for the moment. Uh, the question is, why would God bring evil? You might have heard of Immanuel Kant, who is a German philosopher. 18th century, uh, he argued that God willed sin because it was necessary to the possibility of good in the world. All right. So to bring good, uh, apparently God willed evil. And that's how this particular philosopher, uh, you know, uh, you know reason. Um, another uh, writer, Herman Babnik says the following, he says, light cannot of itself produce darkness. 
and we know when he re- when we talk about light he's referring to god because god uh, is light right light cannot of itself produce darkness the darkness only arises when the light is withdrawn some would say uh, evil or darkness which is uh, you know evil is uh, uh, darkness is representative of evil is the absence of light so that is how some people might put it now in the scriptures we very clearly uh, are told 1 john chapter 1 uh, that is the epistle of john chapter 1 verse 5 says in him is no darkness so in god there is no darkness and obviously <clears throat> he uh, is i mean we conclude that god is not the author of sin or evil but we definitely must conclude and can conclude that sin was in the fore knowledge of god the fore knowledge is not necessarily the you know uh, the the perpetrating of that particular uh, event right uh richard phillips in uh, in his essay the origin of sin he says god sinlessly uses sin so these are different ways that uh, people try to answer uh, but obviously you can see the complexity of this you know where did this where did sin originate uh philips in his uh, essay says the following in answering questions as to the origin of sin while we can affirm many important truths we nonetheless stand before what herman babnik called the greatest enigma of life and the heaviest cross for the intellect to bear so he basically is saying that it is very difficult to answer to give a pointed answer to the question um he goes on to say yet considering the biblical data about sin itself when we ask how beings created as wholly good by god such as the angel lucifer who turned satan and the man adam could will to sin uh, all answers escape us you know in other words he's saying if they were created good uh, how could they will to sin and that's the question he's asking attempts to rationalize the origin of sin run a ground against the essential irrationality of the creature rebelling against the creator right so this are just some thoughts i thought i will mention just to show the complexity of this particular question that we are asking but now i want to go to ezekiel 28 once again we'll look at uh, i thought it was a very interesting uh, uh, paragraph there uh, in ezekiel 28 that brings out uh the that original scenario where we are introduced to the uh sinfulness of a being a created being right so i'm going to read from ezekiel 28 and verse 11 uh once again i'm just going to read it in case you have a bible you can follow along but i'll pick up in verse 11 <clears throat> ezekiel 28 <clears throat> he begins by saying the word of the lord came to me son of man take up a lament concerning the king of tyre and say to him this is what the sovereign lord says king of tyre was a uh, no it, it talks about the king of tyre i'm just, i'll just make some comments as i continue to read we understand through the description given that the king of tyre was a type of the being that is being described in this lament ezekiel was was bringing a lament about what is going to happen and the king of tyre was like a type of this being as we will see it being described uh and we know that uh the king was going to have a similar fate or a similar fall from a position of glory and so this is a prophecy about the king what is going to happen to him and there is this interesting play on words about how uh king of tyre is going to suffer the same fate as another being that is actually being described let me continue reading you were the seal of perfection i am reading again in verse 11 you were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty 
You were in Eden, the garden of God. Let me stop there. That is verse 13, the first part of verse 13. Obviously, when we see, when we read this, it is describing more than a mortal being. Uh, uh, the description is of a, of a primal being, uh, you know, who dwelt in the garden, possibly his original habitation. Once again, we are making inferences. Uh, we, you know, uh, sometimes uh, have to be careful that we don't become too dogmatic in how or what we say, but we're just picking up and making some inferences. In verse 13, it continues, every precious stone adorned you, uh, the carolean and the chrysolite and the emerald and the topaz, onyx and jasper, lapis and lazuli and turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. I, I wondered why, why all these, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, precious stones that is, uh, you know, being used to describe, uh, you know, the situation. And perhaps it's descriptive of a high priestly position. Maybe this being probably had a position that was maybe comparable to a high priest, right? A uh, high priest wears these very costly uh, robes with all kinds of shiny things on it. Maybe it's a description of that. And apparently, in, if you read in Exodus 28, it talks about 12 stones in the priestly garment. And so maybe there is a reference to that. Let me go to verse 14. You were anointed as a guardian carer, for so I ordained you. You are on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stone. So here is a description of, you know, something beyond, one, once again, our understanding. Angelic being, talking about cherubims and seraphims. Right, you know, if you read in the book of Revelation, it brings in these thoughts. Maybe archangel, you know, and talking about you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones, probably a reference or a description of God's presence. So these beings had the blessing of being in God's presence. Verse 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. All right. Uh, so the, uh, the prophet says that this being was blameless, probably the being preserved that original beauty in which he was created, uh, probably indicative of, of being made, uh, you know, having the, having the ability to choose the, 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 the you know, free choice that the being had. And then it says, till wickedness was found in you. Notice now, <laughs> there is no indication where the wickedness came from. Uh, is it self-originated? Is it in the, or it, it, does it have its origin in the exercising of the faculty of choice? The Bible is silent. And this is what sometimes <laughs> makes it difficult. On many occasions, the Bible remains silent about certain things. And we have, through our experience, learned that if the Bible is silent, uh, we must keep our mouths shut. <laughs> because we can say things that may not necessarily be true. But here is where we find that wickedness, the origin of wickedness, seemed to have taken place. And then what happens? Verse 16. Through your widespread, widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. Now, remember, this is a type of the king, physical king of Tyre, as well as this being. Uh, and now widespread uh, trade could indicate the king's, you know, various dealings. Or it could also have some indication of some kind of interactive occupation this being had or uh, interaction with other created beings. But let us notice one interesting thing. You were filled with violence and you sinned. The word sin comes in here, right? And notice what accompanies it, violence. 
we can very clearly conclude the consequence of sin, one of the deadly consequences of sin is violence. And so what does uh, the prophet say? So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stone. It seemed to indicate they resulted in some kind of alienation, loss of uh, being in God's presence, losing the opportunity to be in God's presence. All right. Uh, we won't read too much into it. Uh, it says that God drove him out. It is possible that he himself was self-driven to be away from God's presence because of a sinful uh, nature that he began to adopt. Verse 17 says, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Uh, notice the further consequence of sin or sinfulness. There was corruption and the beauty in which he was created was polluted. Everything was created good, but that good began to be you could say besmirched. It began to be corrupted and, uh, you know, uh, spoiled because of sinfulness. And this is why we say sin is has a deadly consequence. Uh, let me then finish in verse 18. By your, by your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. By your many sins, remember, it started off with wickedness and sinning. Now in verse 18, it talks about by your many sins. In other words, it seemed to indicate that sin has a cascading effect. It leads to further sin. It, it feeds on itself and it multiplies till it envelops the person and begins to completely corrupt the individual. And we know God uh, describing that uh, you know, sin results in death, death of everything that is good, right? And of course, in our case, since we are physical creatures, we finally reach physical death. But death uh, in all aspects, even emotionally, in, in relationally, uh, even the way we deal with the environment, all of that seem to have, uh, you know, a death, a, a decaying effect because of sin. And finally, uh, ending in verse 18. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. I mean, highly symbolic language. Once again, could have applied to King Tyre. Or, uh, but what I want to pick up from there is, uh, notice it says, I made a fire come out from you. Maybe uh, is it indicative of the fact that it is self-destructive? Sin can be self-destructive. It's like a, it's, it's gangrenous, like a disease that consumes from within. So all of these I, I, I pick up as an explanation of what is the, you know, the effects of sin. So have we answered the question, the origin of sin? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the Bible is not explicit, uh, does not give those explicit, explicit answers. Um, one author says the following, it may be good to mention that evil is not a created thing. It is not a creature and has no independent being or existence, you could say. Also, evil has no standard as goodness does. It is a lack, a deficiency, a falling short of the standard of God's perfect goodness. Okay, so um, I'll end there uh, with regards to... Uh, is, uh, Ezekiel 28. I want to read through that because I, I found the descriptions there quite interesting, which, uh, you know, gives us some indication as to how sin plays out in the life of this particular individual created being, this anointed carer. Let me pick up two more thoughts and then I will uh, defer to our discussion. In the answer, it also says its ultimate origin, I mean, this is what I picked up earlier, its ultimate origin is obscure, 
and its enormity perplexes us. Its enormity perplexes us. Once again, we see the enormity of sin. You know, maybe in a, in a, in a small way in Ezekiel 28, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we recognize that there is a deadly, deadly effect of sin. Interestingly enough, the answer talks about, the, about Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God suffers with us. Here is another huge mystery. You know? How does God in Jesus Christ, of course in the incarnation, how does he uh, enter into this sinfulness, you know, uh, especially what affects us as human beings. And he does not keep himself away, you know, from uh, the effect of that sinfulness in us. Uh, obviously, we won't have time to go into that in depth. Maybe we can do it another time. But there is a need for us to acknowledge the fact that God is not, uh, you know, indifferent to sin. He, in his wisdom, uh, recognize the need to enter into the very, you could say, the eye of the storm. Right? He, he went into the very eye of the storm. Uh, and so uh, God, as it says, suffers with us. And so uh, that is, once again, something for us to keep in mind, that uh, he understands it, you could say, from personal experience. Uh, in terms of what sinfulness is. Let me end on a positive note. Here it says, towards the end of the answer, uh, it says that that shall be no more, that evil has no future. Evil has no future. And that is something uh, wonderful for us to behold. Evil has no future. We know that it will end one day. Uh, sin has been destroyed in Jesus. And so if you ask, if you, if you look at the question that was asked in three, uh, why is it that we still, uh, you know, suffer the consequence of sin today, even though Jesus Christ has vanquished it? Uh, the answer, once again, is very difficult to, you know, I mean, we are basically asking why are we suffering? Uh, but we do know that one day it will end. And so in that hope, in that uh, future, we can be absolutely assured that uh, uh, there will be no more, you know, suffering of ourselves in, this, in sinfulness as we do today. Uh, I think I'm going to end there. Let me see if I had one more thought to share with you. Uh, there were some thoughts from... Uh, theologian by name Karl Barth, uh, but I don't think I'll take that because Karl Barth tends to be extremely, you know, complicated in his uh, explanations. I wouldn't want to, you know, confuse you unnecessarily with his perspectives. Uh, we'll leave that for another time. So let me open it up for some thoughts. I hope. Uh, uh, you're not getting disturbed by my dog. My dog is barking outside. Uh, is it is it too disturbing, Praveen? Uh, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that, but this is one of the problems of working from home, I guess. <laughs> You've got to accommodate the dog also. <laughs> All right. So uh, what thoughts could you like? Rekha, I think you have a thought. You're on mute. Rekha, could you unmute yourself? The ultimate aim of sin for most people is to become gods themselves. And that means self-worship. It becomes idol worship, which in itself is bad because it will never eat, eat its, reach its ultimate goal. So sin is bad in that respect. We worship. When the Hindus say, look within yourself to worship, you are actually worshiping yourself in a way. And that is bad. Okay. I, I presume you mean that, uh, uh, I think that is uh, more or less the concept of pantheism where everything is God, uh, we are gods, and so is, is that how it, that is explained? Yes. Okay, right. 
but yes i think uh, the uh, what you mentioned is this uh, self uh, inward uh, looking rather than looking to god from the christian perspective we understand god to be transcendent outside of the creation uh, but uh, some philosophical thoughts bring god into the creation but our god can also be imminent which means he can also be in creation but he is also transcendent yeah i mean big thoughts there yes anil go ahead uh two thoughts here <clears throat> one is on the origin of sin no uh i think or this is just for discussion uh god allows everything so in the ultimate analysis isn't god the originator of sin because to know good you have to know evil as well right without evil you won't know good so evil had to be there for us to know good and to be good that is one point i'm not accusing god of <laughs> introducing of origin but that's just a thought and second thing is that here in the question it says why is there still so much evil in the world one thought there is <clears throat> that jesus is already uh, you know it says here uh, already conquered devil and sin but at the same time it applies to those who have accepted jesus as the savior as who who believe in jesus but majority of the world has not and so in a way why sin still exists is because the majority of the world has still not accepted jesus and they are continuing their merry way uh let me just comment on uh, your second one and the others may join in uh, yes it is true that majority may not have accepted but those who have accepted also suffer <laughs> right probably as a consequence of the sin <laughs> as such right uh yes and so the question is you know if jesus for us has conquered sin why is it that we have to suffer the consequences uh and uh you know once again that is that is the tension we call it the tension un- under which we live uh it is it is how do we say it? we it, it is now but not yet you know that is how we tend to explain it uh yes. we can we can ex- we know that jesus has won the battle and vanquished sin but on the other hand we are only entering the fullness of it uh, because we are not yet in its fullness and that's the reason why that's the best way we can explain it uh right at the moment but going back to your first question uh can we say that god is finally the originator for sin uh once again uh that will land us into all kinds of problems you know uh, <laughs> uh very clearly the bible says in him is no darkness in other words if sin should come from god there must be sin in him if darkness is you know uh is darkness is something that is likened to sin and in him there is no darkness then uh logically we cannot say god is the originator for sin i could say that he had the for for knowledge of sin uh but he does not will us to be sinful or wish us to be sin you know sinners uh that is once again a mystery which i i don't know if we can crack at this time in its fullness we might be able to give some explanation about it but but to know good there has to be evil right so he will uh, in any other way the evil had to be introduced into the world but he can uh, he may not have introduced it but it, it, it had to be there yeah uh, anil there there is one problem and that is uh, you are you are um, alluding to what is called uh, a duality a concept of duality you know mm-hmm. uh that good and evil has equal existence right if you say that to know good there must be evil then you are uh, saying that evil has an equal existence with a uh, good uh, it is like the the mythological uh, stories that god and god who is good and satan who is evil are in a constant battle right that is the dual concept which 
is not, uh, you know, uh, accepted by the Bible. I mean, from a biblical perspective, we cannot accept that because that reduces the sovereignty of God. That means you're saying God is not sovereign. No, the good and evil will not be equal. Uh, I'm not saying they are equal, but evil still has to be there to know good. I mean, it may be in a, even a smaller uh, uh, way or fraction of the good, but still it has to be there. So uh, how do we sort of get past that? Yes, uh, once again, you know, we are getting into more philosophical thought there. Yeah, well, let's, let's move on. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, once again, if we subscribe to that, then you are saying that God has to be, if for God to be good, there has he also has to be evil. You know, so we get into that circular argumentation, which can be a problem. Right? Once again, uh, uh, you know, maybe some of the others have any thoughts to offer. Praveen, you have anything to mention there? Uh, before we come to you, Praveen, Surya Murthy, go ahead. God says in Isaiah, I create evil. That's all I, uh, that's all I want to say. Okay. Yes, sir. That's a scripture that is used very often by people. In fact, even uh, the critics of the Bible, they say, see, God is an evil God because he has evil in him. Uh, maybe we can study that at a different time because that may need some explanation. But let's uh, just see. Praveen, you have any thoughts on, on the whole discussion? Uh, let Sikinder also speak. because. Uh... Yes, yeah, Sikinder, go ahead. Hear me, sir. Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Uncle. Clearly? Yes. Uh, general conception, con general concept is there that sin is originated from the Genesis chapter 1. That is, uh, uh, it is, uh, even though it is written, it started with uh, Adam and Eve's. Am I, am I correct? I think, Sikinder, what you're saying is, uh, you are saying that sin basically started with Adam and Eve. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay, right. The only problem is, if you go to Ezekiel 28, we talk about sin there. Is that, that predates Adam and Eve. Right. That, uh, you have to reconcile those two. That's why I said that it was written, that's all. Before that also, God existed and evil existed. And uh, how long uh, it uh, continues and we study by the word of God. We abide by it. Because it has you know, to remove the sin from us. We depend upon the word of God. Is that right, sir? Let's see God use that evil. Okay. So you're basically saying that Adam and Eve may have existed when uh, Lucifer fell. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Well, once again, I don't think we can put any dates. We, we avoid <laughs> putting any dates. Go ahead, Praveen. Actually, I'm in a position uh, really confused uh, <laughs> to speak because I don't subscribe or presently at this moment, I'm not in a position. Uh, in fact, I'm not convinced uh, with the interpretations of uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 as well as Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, when I consider my take a time, a time for myself uh, as a sincere, you know, to look at the scripture according to the rules of interpretation. Uh, I, uh, most of these theories, uh, they don't make, uh, uh, they, they won't, they, I cannot, uh, what we'll call, approve those primarily. Those are primary, they, they, are, they are called uh, uh, pseudophigraphical uh, theories, which have been developed uh, between uh, the exile and then till, <coughs> The coming of Jesus during this time, these theories have been developed. So, uh, and as well as uh, we need to take a serious uh, time to study Romans chapter five. I, we need to take Romans chapter five more seriously than uh, these theories, which are not uh, totally clear. Uh, which the interpretation itself also so. If I go into explanation, it, it will take time. So it's 6.52 now, maybe. 
that I'll say. But as of now, I'm not in a position to uh, accept uh, these theories. Uh, and uh, enter, we also need to take a moment to look at the nature of sin also uh, with an open mind. To, first of all, to define whether it is a substance or it is insubstantial. Uh, that also we, we need to look at it. Uh, that that takes more into little philosophical uh, side. So maybe when we have time, I would like to share about those. But with these thoughts, I would like to bring before you, uh, so that you can take time in case if you find you can explore for yourself also. You confused us further. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we'll do is. Uh, uh, you know, once again, there is so much we can talk about and uh, it can become a never-ending discussion <laughs> because, you know, you can never fully exhaust the complete, uh, the fullness of, uh, you know, the understanding on these. So what we'll do is our task is only to look into what has been written from the We Believe series. So... I, I go a little extra, but I don't go too much into it because, you know, it's not a complete theological study of uh, the whole thing. So uh, we are limited from the perspective of uh, how it has been written for us in the, uh, in, in the, in the booklet. So um, if you have to do a full study on that, maybe we can allot the right kind of time for that. So... So we can leave that for the moment. Uh, maybe if anybody else have any thoughts or questions, uh, uh, we just have just a few minutes left. Can I say something? Uh, yes, Vincent, go ahead. In, in the NIV, Isaiah 45, 7, he doesn't mention, it's not mentioned evil. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. So the question of evil doesn't come in. Okay. While, while the King James Version mentions evil. Okay. So maybe we need to go back to the origin uh, language. Right. Right. A lot of, lot of uh, prophetical statements in uh, Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel, especially the, these things. Uh, many of them are, exa some of them are exaggeration as well as uh, poetic. So we cannot take all those words literally also. They are poetic in nature as well as some of them are exaggeration. That is to explain. Uh, no need to take exaggeration negatively. Bible uses, in fact, Jesus used exaggerations in certain places. So some of them are part of those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Vincent, for that reference. Uh, I think um, since we just have a few minutes left, let me just end on this note. Once again, uh, to explain, you know, some of the questions we have dealt with, you know, in terms of the origin of sin and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, what exactly is sin, uh, you know, are going to be a huge task. And I believe that you might, we might never be able to put a finger on it, you know, precisely. But one thing we know, that sin obviously and sinfulness is obviously something that the Bible speaks very negatively about. We know its consequences. We know Jesus Christ came to uh, rid us of sin. And I think maybe that is more important for us to understand that Christ is, has saved us from sin and its consequence. And uh, we have a future where these kinds of, you know, this kind of a situation will never exist. It's going to end. And evil and sin has no future. I think on that note, we leave it because uh, we can get into, you know, uh, you know, a discussion uh, to such an extent where sometimes we can, 
you know without the answers we can only get more confused but we 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 stick to the main uh, focus of the scriptures that sin is indeed bad and the bible does not take it lightly it has been dealt with by jesus christ and we have a wonderful future because of him so thank you very much for joining us today uh, and uh, very grateful to you for uh, your time uh, we will keep you informed of uh, you know whatever we are trying to uh, bring in for discussion uh, let me ask uh, uh, let me see uh, surya murthy would you like to offer a closing prayer today short one <clears throat> short one yes <laughs> <laughs> our father in heaven we are very much thankful for these weekly bible studies we understand the scriptures more and more and today we have seen and at least we have tried to see how the sin originated please continue to guide us to understand more and more about the sin matter uh, i ask you i ask you in the name of jesus christ Amen. Amen. Thank, thank, thank you very much.